Hello, welcome to the recording of Mick Cook's interview on 15th of June 2020 on offshore site investigations. We missed the first couple of minutes of Mick's interview uh, due to a couple of technical problems. So the only questions you've missed are me introducing Mick to the audience and him giving a short outline on his career. So we join you now when he's going through his explanation of what offshore site investigation involves, talking about the geophysics and the geotechnics. So over to Mick. Uh, for a whole range of different things. Uh, obviously, I've always focused on the geophysical side of things. Uh, I mean, geophysics, we tend to use, uh, uh, primarily it's, it's the use of sound, but also we use occasionally magnetics, um, resistivity, and other sort of physical aspects. But it's mainly sound, as I say, to investigate the seabed and cello geology. Uh, for a whole range of different aspects in various industry sectors. Uh, but primarily, I've worked in oil and gas uh, and more likely in offshore wind. Mm, okay. And, and, you know, what was your early experience of offshore, offshore site investigation? Uh, it was very primitive, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, I joined a company called Fairfield Industries in, in early 1980. In fact, I believe John Arthur is one of the directors of that company is on the call, actually. Uh, John was my first director. Um, Fairfield Industries was a, an American seismic company uh, that was, apply, was applying uh, conventional exploration seismic techniques to the site investigation industry. In fact, Fairfield were the forerunners of doing digital, what's called digital seismic or multi-channel seismic now for site investigation. So um, yeah, it was early days within the site investigation business. Uh, uh, I guess one of my first, thought, my early thoughts was it enabled me to travel. And I know people these days, younger people travel all the time, but of course, when I was around, born in the fifties, uh, we didn't travel very much at all. In fact, I'm, I think the first time I went overseas when I was about 16 or 17, mm. uh, but I joined the, uh, um, I joined Fairfield. Um, my first job was off the north coast of Spain. Second job was, was off the east coast of the USA. And my third job was in the South China Sea. Uh, to me, this is absolutely fantastic. So, um, yeah, early, early experience of offshore site investigation. Um, it was actually camaraderie. We were in it together. There's no choice about it. Uh, it was a very, very primitive exercise. Uh, you never quite knew when you were going where, etc. So it's quite difficult to to plan your family and social life. But it was really exciting, really interesting. Uh, and one notable thing is uh, there was a real lack of HSE and environmental uh, consideration that was almost non-existent mm -hmm. in those days. Okay. Yeah. No, that aspect certainly changed a lot. You know. Uh, you see those pictures of people working at sea with no, certainly no steel toe cap shoes or hard hats or anything like that, let alone uh, some of the other uh, things that we have to worry about these days. I've, yes. got a great, I've got a great photo, which is taken on the Prince Maddox, the early Prince Maddox, not the current one, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. at Bangor University. And it's got one of, uh, one of my colleagues up there, it was on the back deck, uh, uh, absolutely no hard hat, no steel toe caps, and he was smoking a cigarette, falling asleep on the back deck. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, the the pictures we're not allowed to put online anymore. Yes, you know all all, all those kind of things, and 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 so you know what what were the primary challenges then to you to you at that early stage? I say it, it was actually very early days of marine site investigation. So in many respects, I'm sure we hear from people later on, but we were finding our way really. Uh, so um, offshore site investigation was very much in its infancy and. One of the primary problems we had was, uh, for those who've worked offshore will know this, there are no signposts. So you've got to position where your vessel is and where your equipment is. And uh, the positioning was very, very basic in those days. In fact, just prior to me starting, a lot of the positioning systems didn't work overnight, for instance. So you, you didn't, you'd have a nice break overnight. But uh, yep, uh, positioning was a real issue. And uh, I learned a lot about positioning because you have to keep going and recalibrating our position uh, systems. Uh, communications, it's hard for young people to realise, but actually communications was all done uh, via, I think it was Porty said radio. If you wanted to make a call, mm. yeah. you had to book a call over the radio. Uh, we didn't have mobile phones or anything like that. Um, one good thing about those early days were, because we had to do a lot of things from first principles, you actually got to really understand how things worked. Uh, I think these days with, and we'll come on to computerisation later, I'm sure, but... Uh, 
Um, we didn't have computer algorithms and things to help us. A lot of stuff was actually done from from first principles, which mean meant you had to really understand what was going on. Mm. Um, I guess another thought from those early days was site investigation was very much a Cinderella subject in that uh, a lot of people did their site investigation because they felt they needed to do it for insurance. Mm. There was less emphasis on the actual importance of the data more, well, that's something we need to do before we get on, before we get off the engineering. Um, I'd also say in the early days, it, it was the various G, G and G subjects, you know, geophysics, geotennis, geology, geomorphology, ge all those sort of Gs were not really particularly joined up. And uh, it was left to the individual uh, just to utilize their experience. Whereas I think as I'll probably say later when we chat, uh, it's much more joined up these days. Yeah. Of course, I mentioned lack of commu uh, computerizations. We had computers at university, but they were mainframes. We didn't have laptops and desktops and that sort of things when we first started. So everything we done virtually did virtually was actually hydraulic, mm. which um, a lot of younger people would probably not <laughs> yes. not recognise today. Yeah, and and of course, when you first started, me this is pre GPS as well, isn't it? So you're using what oh, deck and navigator, Loran, even even sextants, I guess. Yeah, my 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 experience is really Pulse Eight in the North Sea, which was um, a Decca um, radio mm -hmm. position system. But working in other parts of the world, we had to set up our own radio positioning system. So we'd have three or four people sitting on islands around the South China Sea operating a radio station. Uh, yeah, it was very, very primitive. Yes, yes. And, and were you putting down equipment on the seafloor to position fix relative to that as well? Uh, we, we did when, when we really need that accuracy. Yeah, yeah. But it wasn't used conventionally, no, no. Yeah. Or should I should say it wasn't used as a matter of course. Mm. Okay, Dave. So given that those were your sort of primary challenges in, in, in the early days, what, what in your view would be the most significant developments that we've, we've now seen in these intervening decades? I guess my question is, how long have we got? <laughs> <laughs> You're right, for a good, a good 15 or 20 minutes, so, so there you go. <laughs> things have changed so much over, well, the, the time I've been in the industry, say the last 40 years, things have changed so much, it's almost unrecognisable. I guess... Just starting with the big things, uh, um, the vessels, for instance. Uh, the vessel I first started on, John Arthur is on the call, will know is that it was a vessel called the Equistar, which was a converted Hebridean ferry. Uh, and uh, whilst it was a very sturdy vessel, it wasn't really suited to do geophysics, really. Uh, uh, it was very, very primitive. But obviously, now there's a number of Fugro people on the call, as no, um, I know, and um, looking at the new Fugro vessels that we've been developed over the last 15, 20 years. Mm. To say that it's like chalk and cheese is, uh, <laughs> is, you know, it's an understatement, really. So, yeah, the, um, the vessels and the state of the vessels uh, has changed enormously. Probably the biggest change to me is computerization, because obviously within geophysics, you acquire masses and masses and masses of data, and the ability to process that data fast and efficiently and to store it and to visualize it, et cetera, et cetera. Has been a been a huge change. Wow. Quite ironically, the actual the actual equipment, um, you know, the sources we use in geophysics, you know, boomers and spark yeah. and air guns and all those sorts of things, have, have not really changed that much. Now there may be some people on the line that say, "Oh yes, my company has done." You know, I'm not saying there's been no change, but actually, when I think back to 40 years ago, the sort of systems we were using, I think they use better now than they were maybe in terms of. Uh, the equipment's more reliable, and but the actual the physics has not changed, and there's not been a huge change in the actual basic sources that we use. I've got to say a bit more about that in a while, but uh, mm. um, I think multi-channel seismic, as I say, was just being introduced to the site investigation industry when I first joined. Uh, prior to that, it was mainly single channel, and anyone who knows anything about geophysics will realise the, um, the limitations of single channel versus multi-channel, and well, that's made a huge difference. It's also worth saying as well, a lot of the development within the marine site investigation business has really come from the exploration industry, which is much bigger and much more, much better um, funded, and has a much higher profile, et cetera, than marine site investigation. We have a lot to thank from the oil and gas exploration industry, uh, which mm -hmm. is where a lot of this really started uh, for the developments. Um, swath bathymetry, 
uh, when yeah. I first started, it was single channel echo sounding. It wasn't quite lead lining as some of uh, some of my colleagues, <laughs> my colleagues would have actually said in the past. It, it, uh, it was single channel echo sounder, very very primitive again. Uh, spot the now has enabled us to produce fantastic pictures of the seabed. Um, I think I, I mentioned the word uh, holistic earlier on. Um, I think the approach now is much more holistic than it used to be. Uh, so in other words, you've got a lot more integration of the various Gs that I mentioned. Mm. And I think that's a really, really good thing. Uh, look at a seabed and the shallow geology is not about just the geophysics. Uh, there's a lot of a th lot of other things you've got to take into account. And I think that's done a lot, a lot better now than it used to be. Um, obviously, the introduction of autonomy uh, has, has proven to be a great, a great advancement. And I think that will continue to, uh, to develop in the future. But I think probably the biggest difference I've noticed over the last 40 years or so is the fact that um, site, marine site investigation is taken a lot more seriously it was when I first started in the industry. It was, as I said earlier on, it was an insurance job. You know, we need to do this just to make sure that we're actually covered from an insurance point of view. But now, a lot more interest taken. People are realising there's a lot of benefit to be gained from the data obtained from the site investigation. So yeah, there's a, I could talk forever on this, but I'm sure people on the line could too. <laughs> okay. And, and to what extent is there standardisation in the sector, Mick? I mean, is everybody using their own proprietary systems or have you found that over the years people have evolved in a more or less parallel way with the different companies? Uh, there's all sorts of proprietary systems, but most people use two or three different type, types of systems. Yeah, there's, there's not a huge discrepancy uh, throughout, throughout the world. I'd say the, the approach... I think has been helped by over the years, as you know, through through the SCT and OSIG and various other organisations, uh, we prepared the number of guidelines. And I think the approach to site investigation now is, is probably more standardised than it used to be. But mm -hmm. um, equipment wise, yeah, it's not, not a huge variety. Yeah. OK. Then. And have there been particular individuals, you know, you know, as well, who've had a uh, you know, significant impact on your in your career? Far too many to name. <laughs> but, yeah. uh, just Indeed, some may be on this call. So. Oh, oh, some, some, some are definitely on this call. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, yeah. If I think of, uh, I, could, I, I guess my first experience at Fairfield. Well, it, no, it actually it predates that. Obviously, my first experience was actually at Bangor University. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Denzel Taylor Smith, who was, um, uh, was head of the course that I did up there, um, the Scottish guy, a lovely guy called Sinclair Buckham, who a lot of people will know. Uh, Absolutely fantastic teacher, really enthusiastic. He really took his teaching very, very seriously. Um, John Simpson, who was head of school when I was first there, uh, actually took me on to do my MSc, despite the fact I wouldn't, I told him I wouldn't come if he didn't give me a grant. He actually found a grant for me. And then within a week of being there, I changed from oceanography to the hybrid. Uh, so I've got, I've got those guys to thank for that. Uh, mm. um, and then there were pe pe people around, um, People in Fairfield, I mentioned John, Ar John Arthur in Fairfield, um, uh, Mike Marrick, my first boss who went to work for MV. Uh, um, yeah, lot, lots of people there. And then I guess I, jo I joined Horace, so I didn't actually really relate my career earlier on, but after Fairfield, I worked at Fairfield for about four years or so and uh, was promoted to way above my capability far too early. <laughs> and. Uh, it's often the case with youth, isn't it? Not that I was that young, but uh, um, I, I actually thought I'd learnt everything I needed to learn at Fairfield after about four years. And so I joined an embryonic consultancy called HydroSearch, which, uh, which was one of the first consultancies around, really, I guess. And uh, it was mainly working in the North Sea, mainly on survey and site investigation and things. And um, the guys that actually founded HydroSearch were all far more experienced than I was. And uh, I learned enormous amounts from those guys in the first four or five years at Hydra Search. Uh, they were in, in the main 10, 15, 20 years in advance of me. So uh, that was very useful. Uh, I worked very closely with a guy called Phil Williams, who uh, became managing director. In fact, he was managing director when I first joined Hydra Search. And that Phil interviewed me, in fact. And Phil and I, over the next 20 years, worked incredibly closely together. I, um, Phil. Phil actually was a geophysicist by background as well, but I didn't, didn't just learn um, geophysics from Phil, who was a very, very bright individual. I also 
between the two of us, we learned an awful lot about business as well. <laughs> so mm-hmm. that was that was very good. Um, um, yeah, and I guess I, you know, I, I, we were then bought by RPS, and then when people know in two thousand three, so that's seventeen years ago. Um, I learned a lot about business at RPS rather than geophysics, in that we acquired twenty businesses in the five years I was managing director. Uh, so I learned enormous amounts about business, and probably my knowledge of geophysics went backwards. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, so I, um, there were people there, obviously, that I learned from. But, but also, um, since I've been doing my own consultancy, um, I've been exposed to lots of things I wouldn't have been exposed to as if I'd stayed in one com- company. So yeah, I, I learned an awful lot from different people there. Again, primarily from the business point of view now, rather, rather from a geophysical point of view. Yeah. Um, Last but not least, I would say that uh, uh, probably I'll gain most from being a member of the OSIG committee, uh, the Offshore Site Investigation and Geotechnics Committee, mm-hmm. which you know, is a, uh, a, um, a primary special interest group within the SUT, the Society for Underwater Technology. Uh, and I, um, I joined the SUT probably in the mid 1980s, I guess, found it to be an excellent organization and uh, was invited to join the OSIG committee. I can't remember the dates now, but probably mid to late eighties, something like that. Uh, chaired, chaired it for 10 years or so, really, really enjoyed it. And I'm still a member of the OSIG committee now, as you know. Yeah, uh, that's right. And uh, I, I should add to our listeners that, uh, you know, Mick is, you know, tr- treasurer of SUT, mem- mem- member of council, one of our officers, and that business experience that, uh, you know, Mick brings with him, has been transformational, you know, in helping SUT to still be here <laughs> you know, compared to the state it was in uh, not that many years ago. So, you know, my, my personal thanks to Mick on that front as well. So how do you think offshore site investigation is going to develop in the, in the coming years, Mick? Uh, I don't really have a crystal ball, but I've obviously mm. got my own thoughts and I'm sure people on the call will have their thoughts as well. Um, mm. uh, for, for a long, long time, almost as long as I can remember, almost as long as I've been in the industry, actually, uh, uh, the exploration side of things moved to the use of 3D techniques. Uh, this has always been a possibility within site investigation. In fact, it's been a reality now for quite a number of years, but the extra expense of doing 3D, uh, seismic in particular, for site investigation has been very, very slow to mature. In fact, it still hasn't matured. But anybody who knows anything about geophysics will realize that actually uh, when looking at seismic, whether it be very shallow or excavation, whatever it is, doesn't matter. The use of 3D seismic over and above 2D seismic, uh, the differences are vast. Mm -hmm. Uh, And um, I'm hoping that uh, as the industry matures, more and more 3D work will be shot. And work is being done. lots of the larger oil companies are actually using it. Uh, Southampton University have been working on very, very shallow 3D seismic uh, through the likes of Justin Dix. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm just hoping, I think the downside to, to it is that as, our, as um, oil and gas begins to transition to maybe offshore wind and marine renewables, maybe the need or the drive behind 3D seismic will not be quite as great. Uh, so whether or not 3D seismic will actually continue to mature with insight investigation, who knows? Mm. I think looking forward, uh, geophysics, uh, as I mentioned earlier on, you acquire masses and masses of data. This all has to be processed and interpreted and reported, etc. And I'm sure that uh, eventually artificial intelligence will actually mm. be a contributor towards the processing and interpretation of that data. Um, I say it's the human mind is great, <laughs> computers are great. <laughs> I think if you combine the two together in some sort of form of artificial, artificial intelligence and machine learning and this sort of thing, then uh, I think future interpretations, whilst I don't think you'll ever do away with the human, because the one thing I haven't mentioned during this talk, which I know anybody's been to my, my, um, uh, the talk I do for the OSIN training courses we do, I always talk about geophysics as part art and part science. And what I mean by that is, it's obviously a science. <laughs> it's a no-brainer, of course it's a science. But there is an art in the way that we actually interpret data. Yes. And I think 
GFS. GFS is, I think GFS is something cool will back me up on this, uh, in that uh, each time you look at a set of seismic data or a set of geophysical data, uh, it is very much an interpretation. It's a remote sensing tool that has to be interpreted. And with the best will in the world, uh, machines, I'm sure, can actually get into the brains of geophysicists eventually. But that human uh, gut feel, that sort of, you know, you've seen this before, not quite sure that that's right or whatever it is, uh, mm. will be lost. Mm. Mm. So the bit, probably, probably, Probably the biggest transition will be the end user uh, of much marine site investigation. Um, as I say, the last 40 years, the main end user of marine site investigation has been the oil and gas industry. And it's been a real driver of uh, the subjects. But as we transition from oil and gas to um, non-carbon non energy, sure. uh, offshore wind uh, and marine renewables, the requirements of those industries uh, are slightly different. They still require geophysical input, a site investigation input, but the requirements are slightly different. For instance, uh, within the oil and gas industry, uh, the site investigation side, we've been interested to look down to 1,000 metres or more below the seabed. Mm. And we've also been investigating in very, very deep water. Um, uh, with offshore wind and with marine renewables, uh, we may not need to look so deeply in terms of the seabed and the shallow geology, and we probably won't be going into such deep water either. Um, but, but who knows? And I guess my final thought on where where things are going, I, I've mentioned integration and the holistic approach quite a few times during this uh, brief chat. And I think the integration continues, and I think it will continue. Uh, into the future become much more well developed as people realize that uh, looking at the seabed and the shallow geology is not, a, not just about the geophysics or the geotechnics, it's a combination of all, all, lots and lots of different factors. Yeah, and do you think there'll be a role in you know, deep sea mining if that becomes a real industry in the next few years? Sure, yeah, sure, yeah, yeah. Um, you, there's a number of sectors I haven't mentioned where marine site investigation is important. Uh, marine minerals and mining is very important. In fact, it's important now uh, in things like uh, uh, the exploration and exploitation of sand and gravel and that sort of thing. Yes. Very yeah. important. Yes, um, I've not I've not mentioned the fact that uh, um, we've got a, a, a very well developed uh, submarine cable sector, mm -hmm. yep. which not only serves uh, offshore wind but also telecoms and um, power interconnectors. And also to a lesser extent in the oil and gas business. Yeah, and sure. Mm. Ports and harbours and um, pipelines and all sorts of different, uh, mm. different specialisms whereby marine site investigation is important, yeah. Yeah, and, and you've spoken about a lot of those high points and the relationships and the technologies throughout your career, Mick. You know, are there times in your career where it didn't go quite so well? <laughs> Lots. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I guess to start off with that, uh, I've been in the, I've been in the uh, an offshore site investigation business for 40 years now, and yeah. I've actually lost count whether or not this is my sixth or my seventh oil and gas downturn. Right. <laughs> using at present, it's either six or seven. So obviously, uh, um, none of those have been particularly pleasant, uh, but they've all followed a, a very, a very, very sort of cycle, a very, very similar pattern. Mm -hmm. Some have been deeper than others, and I think the one we had before this one is probably the deepest and probably the most changes. But of course, we're more at present. So yeah, there's been lots of ups and downs. But um, from a personal point of view, probably the biggest down for me, when I was first in the industry, I mentioned I worked in the South China Sea. I did quite a lot of work out there in probably the early 80s. Uh, all very uh, primitive, explorative stuff. And uh, me as a young geophysicist, uh, actually responsible for surveys out there. Yeah. I remember we did some work for uh, um, Mobile in the South China Sea, ju uh, just off um, Nichuna Island. And this was for an exploration well they were looking to drill. Uh, out on the vessel, acquired the data, came back, oversaw the processing, did the interpretation. Uh, Mobile moved a drill ship onto the site to drill the well and bear in mind the primary purpose of what we were doing was looking at the top hole drilling conditions for the drill ship. 
for those who don't know, when you're drilling the top hole of a well, you, you, you're you drilling it in an uncontrolled fashion. So you don't want any surprises such as a shallow gas, a shallow water flows, these, these types of things. Unfortunately, uh, the drill ship hit a shallow gas pocket. Uh, I can't remember what depth, that's something like six, 700 meters below the seabed. Um, and the drill ship, uh, it took 24 hours to sink. From my point of view, very, very luckily, because uh, there's obviously a lot of people. To get off, yes. I managed to get all the people off, but, uh, but obviously uh, the drill ship sank. Yep. Uh, and obviously there was an inquiry. <laughs> Not surprising. So I spent a very, very uncomfortable three months uh, when uh, um, my work as a young geophysicist was raped over <laughs> in minute detail. Um, but and it was a very very uncomfortable period. I thought it was the end of my career, basically. But luckily for me, um, no one was killed, and there was no fault found in what we'd done in, in terms yeah. of survey, in terms of positioning, in terms of how the data had been acquired, how it had been processed and interpreted. But that was a very very low point, and I guess that was a defining point for me as well, because I guess I really grew up in those three months <laughs> and realised how important what we as marine site investigation people do. And interesting, that leads me on to another little story, really. I remember in my days in hydro search, uh, over the years, we grew that business. We we're very, we're the largest business that was kind in the world, the largest consultants anyway. And um, we, we took on a lot of people over the 20 years. And uh, some of the more interesting people to take on in those days were people who would actually work for oil companies. Uh, some were excellent and some were not quite so good because they found the transition from working for an oil company to uh, um, a consultancy um, quite challenging. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember being in one meeting with one of our explorationists uh, who'd worked for one of the majors and he was telling the Marine Site Investigation Group that of course the work they did in choosing where to actually drill an oil and gas well uh, it was extremely important because if it was dry, then it cost the company millions of dollars. And I had to, um, I had to uh, uh, point out to him that in the marine site investigation business, um, if the the old company drew a well and it blew out, mm -hmm. it killed people and damaged the environment, and he he suddenly became very quiet. <laughs> so, uh, you know. <laughs> Uh, but that was around the time when the site investigation business started to become, in a lot of people's eyes, a lot more important than it perhaps was initially. Yeah. Yes, yes. So valuable lessons learned. Yes. Right. So I think we, we, we've got sort of 15, 20 minutes left. I think this is probably a good point if uh, people in the audience would like to ask Mick any, any particular questions. Now, because we're using Zoom rather than some of the other ones, I don't know it's got a stick your hands up. Uh, option here uh looking across this but if uh if um if people politely call out i can see john john arthur's got his hand up i can see on the screen so 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 john if you unmute yourself uh and, and you, you you can ask a question or i can unmute you from here i think if you can't i'll unmute there we oh, are yep yeah. well mick thank you very much for that uh marvelous to hear it all again as it were because of course i'm part of that 50 years <laughs> although I do accept that you've missed the first 10. Um, the question I feel is one that we still face. Have we integrated the geotechnical information sufficiently? I do know that there are people working on seismic inversion, and I'm encouraging this in, in, in my uh, role on committee, but I still feel that we need to bring the geophysics and the geology and the geotechnics into an integrated situation. I think the simple answer to your question is, it's a bit like uh, um, the racism question that we're trying to answer today in Britain. I think we've come a long way, but we're certainly not there. <laughs> <laughs> um, a lot more needs to be done, obviously. I think the OC group, which uh, for people that don't know, was set up initially uh, to bring together geophysicists and geotechnical engineers in the marine environment. Uh, part, partly prompted, uh, by uh, a famous paper by uh, a fellow from BP, the Vandy Hills on the call, you'll know, uh, uh, that wrote a paper in the late 70s called Is Geophysics Relevant? Okay. <laughs> if anybody uh, 
if anybody wants to Google it, you should you'll be able to find that. But uh, in the late 70s, I think most geotechnical engineers didn't think that geophysics was relevant. Uh, over the years now, I've met lots and lots and lots of geotechnical engineers who do actually feel it's relevant. But that's your question, John. Uh, we've come a long way, but uh, there's still a lot to do. Great, so good, fair answer. Anybody else got any questions for, for Mick? I've, I've, if, you, if you pop your cameras on and wave your arms around, I'll be able to see who, uh, who has a question. Otherwise, just call out, please. I'm sure there'll be somebody. You need to unmute your microphone there. Who have we got? No, no I can see and Andy Hill is registered, but I can't see his name on the list unless he's masquerading as somebody else. We can't ask any uh, <laughs> any dodgy questions there. Tony, you always ask a good question. Are you going to uh, th th throw one in today? It twisted me up. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, one, one relevant to me. Have you got any tribologists involved in um, the geophysics and the geotechnical side of things? You have to remind me where a tribologist is. <laughs> oh, you'll have to listen to the podcast, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm thinking in terms of uh, particularly seabed um, uh, site surveys, so tribology, friction, lubrication and wear. And apart from mechanical engineering uh, applications, um, there are lots of others. Uh, and one of them is actually the properties of the seabed when it comes to pipelines and so on. I'm just wondering if that's something that that's at that stage of size investigation that's something that's considered uh there's probably other people on the line better better qualified to answer that than me actually um i think there are some people that i saw registered that actually uh have, have specialized in pipeline engineering or cable engineering um the answer is i, I don't actually know how how much effort is put into that cool. Do we have that, might, that might be the answer, of course. <laughs> the, one, the, one, the one thing I do know is, is that um, one of our OSIG members, um, uh, Professor Justin Dix, found... Ignore that. <laughs> That's my phone going off. Um, yeah, Professor Justin Dix down at Southampton University is doing, he's doing a lot of work on the, on the impact of the soils on heat... Um, on heat dissipation within cables uh, at present. In fact, I had a very interesting talk from him uh, just a week ago, in fact, actually. Whether that is actually tribology <laughs> or not, I'm not sure, strictly. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's, it's, you know, I mean, tribology basically is if you have two surfaces moving, one moving relative to the other, that's, that, that's tribology. And I, I guess actually the thermal, uh, thermal buildup could be something that changes the friction characteristics. So, so yes, that sort of thing could be right. Well, that that is certainly starting to be done, and a, a lot of research has been done into that. But I think they're looking at mainly from the uh, uh, um, the power losses or, or or the power efficiency of actually put, putting power through uh, cables, etc. Um, and the assumptions they've made about the seabed. Uh, up until now in the engineering community uh, have been far from the truth basically <laughs> and uh, I think their eyes have been open that we actually do quite we do know quite a lot about the seabed and that uh, the seabed is not the same the world over <laughs> so uh, yeah okay yeah, thanks they remember we call it geotribology and then we can yeah exactly yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I like it yeah. Yeah. Is, is there anyone else in the audience who, who want to try and answer Tony's question on the tribology side No, I don't see anybody. Uh, I don't see anybody <laughs> volunteering. So you, you got them stumped there, Tony. So okay. they, yeah, yeah, well done. Just, just, just to add for those who've been taking part in the online training courses we do, uh, Tony is doing one um, a week tomorrow. We, uh, a week Tuesday, he'll be doing uh, the first of a two-part session on subsea tribology. So, so, that, that, so that, those who need to learn more about the weird and wonderful world of uh, lubrication of sliding services in the uh, the deep sea sector 
they will, can le learn all they need to know in, over, over, over a couple of weeks sessions with, with, with Tony Globe. So any more questions before we can let uh, Mick free her to p p pursue his, uh, his interests for the rest of the day there. <laughs> and uh, I'll be recording this and uploading it to uh, the SUT YouTube channel as well if anybody needs to pick up on anything they missed at the earlier, the earlier stage. Yeah, we've got another one from uh, John. Yes, I wonder if you could tell us what your view is on the use of 3D seismic. I do remember the joy that we had years and years, decades ago, when Total first said, well, let's do 3D on the site survey. And really, at that point, we begin to discover the fact that a one-dimensional geotechnical hole needs to be expanded into the three-dimensional geological environment. Are we, I, can, I, I hope I can say we, but is the industry moving sufficiently strongly towards 3D site investigation? No, it's a simple answer. Uh, there are, there have been moves uh, and people are doing 3D, but no, it's certainly not commonplace, not by a long way. There might be some people in the contractors may have their view on that as well, actually, because I know that obviously a lot of time and effort has been spent in actually offering these systems. But I would say with, with, a, with a small number of exceptions, it tends to be the, la the larger oil and gas companies that tend to go for this. I'd say in the main, no, it's not. Right? Mm. Maybe wow. the contractors can actually give a, uh, a view from their point of view. I know there are people from Guardline and few, at least I think they are, Guardline and uh, uh, from Fugro. Does anyone want to comment on that? Or even one of the consultants that sets up and project managers uh, yes. these, these types of surveys. Okay. Oh, yeah. Who's, who's um, yeah, there's one that's come through from uh, uh, Shruti saying, uh, you said that 3D seismic would not be fully developed. Do you think it will be utilised in the future for carbon capture and storage for studying geological formations? Oh, hell, I hope so. yeah. <laughs> now that, yeah, that is, uh, that's a good, a good thought, actually, because uh, I think I mentioned earlier that with the transition from oil and gas to offshore wind, marine renewables, etc., I think part of the transition will be carbon capture and storage. Mm -hmm. And I think you've got, you're going to be looking at much deeper uh, shallow geology than we will when we just put stretches on the seabed. So it may well be that it becomes an important factor if we go to carbon capture and storage, which you almost certainly will, as say, the larger companies are already actually, uh, are either doing in the case of Equinor or are actually uh, planning to do this type of work in the near future. Okay. And, yeah. and, and I suppose a, a supplemental question to that, um, Mick, from me is, you mentioned that these things are generating, you know, terabytes of data, you know, vast, vast data sets. Are these then, are they in a sort of pu public domain storage or are they in storage just under company auspices? You know, do they go into any of these big international sort of UN curated international ocean data exchanges or anything like that? I'm not aware they go into any, any of those of those more so international or public. You know, it'd all be all be proprietary. Mm. Uh, yeah, uh, there is still a, uh, a a proprietary nature to much of the data acquisition. Mm. And 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 as you said earlier, it requires that human element of interpretation as well, doesn't it? So I guess just having large raw data sets is is of limited value without the trained human to interpret it. Mm -hmm. I also don't think there's a, there's a huge amount of data sharing really either because mm -hmm. uh, there is a commercial element to the data that's acquired. Uh, unlike, I guess, in the oceanographic community, you know, the more sort of ocean, ocean wide oceanographic community where, yes. where you yeah. do. Yeah. That that's true. Yeah. Well, water column data does tend to be pretty widely yeah. internationally shared, but as soon as there's commercial value, which, which tends to be in seabed data uh, as yeah. opposed to water column, um, you know, quickly things start hiding behind paywalls, I suppose, to use a, an appropriate phrase. Well, there have been, and there have been some uh, attempts to share, uh, to, 
to try and put data into a shared uh, domain, but they've never really come to anything, as far as I'm aware, anyway. Hmm. Okay. So a final one from me, and, and then we, we, I suppose we can wrap up unless anyone has any more questions, is in, in terms of the SUT role uh, there, 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 Mick, is there, is, there, is there any more we should be doing or could be doing to help take these things forward? Uh, yep, I think, I think as far as the SUT goes, um, the environment is becoming more and more and more important. Um, and uh, as far as I'm aware, we don't have a specialist uh, a special interest group which actually looks at the marine environment per se okay you perhaps want to look at that uh you could you could say the same on the safety side as well i you know there are elements of environment and safety in some of the special interest groups but there's nothing per se and i think the environmental one would be a good one to sort of look at yeah okay That's um, we don't we don't at present we have a renewables group but it, it tends to be more what i would call the wet renewables rather than offshore wind yes and i think we really ought to uh uh, start maybe to looking at having a more uh, um, renewables, um, the current day renewables type of special interest group. Um, within OSIC now, uh, it's pretty noticeable that whilst 10 years ago, the vast majority of OSIC members were either oil and gas or they were from academia. Uh, I would say that oil and gas versus offshore wind is about 50-50 now on the OC committee with, with several academics. So mm. um, yeah, we're definitely moving that way. Yep. Good. We've got two, two more questions coming on the chat. There's one from uh, Anna Fulop yep. uh, saying, uh, what are your thoughts on the move to remote operations, i.e. putting a geophysicist in an office instead of on board the vessel? Yeah, first of all, I'll say good afternoon to Anna. She's a... Uh, um, Banga uh, graduate, <laughs> oh. who uh, is our head of things at Fugro in Aberdeen. Um, uh, funny enough, Anna, this was talked about back in about 1988. <laughs> 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 uh, I, I remember the only management course I've ever been sent on was, one, was by one of the majors. Uh, that at the time we, we used to oversee the um, marine site investigations and um, they were looking to implement a QA system which meant we didn't have to have people offshore so basically we would uh, um, we'd actually write specification for the survey and we send the boat offshore and it would all be done without any oversight um, over a small number of years it was recognized that that perhaps wasn't really good from both an economic or from a a practicality point of view. That said, uh, with better communications, with the internet, etc., 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 I do know now that all. Go away. So I should say to everybody: don't forget to put your phones on silent. No, I can't. I can't turn my landline off, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. The jack plug out, I guess. It's the landline. Um, uh, yeah, but uh, I, I have heard recently, uh, particularly things like well site geology now, a lot of that is actually done onshore. The well site geologist doesn't go off to the rig and actually do, do his or her work. I think the problem we have with geophysics, and it's a good question, Anna, is geophysics is an incredibly subjective um, uh, uh, subject. <laughs> uh, and I think there's, there's as much a feel as to whether the data is appropriate or not. And it is very difficult in an office to say whether or not you're going to accept a data set without actually being in the field and actually seeing how it's being acquired, in what weather conditions, etc., etc. So whilst we may eventually move to a more sort of office-based approach, I think having people on the ground, or should I say on the sea, on the sea surface, I think is... Um, I can't, I can't see it being established very quickly and very easily. Okay. And uh, Alex Searle has sent in a question. He says, uh, Mick, with the well-publicised decline in geoscience degree uptake, how do you think that might impact on the future of site investigation and survey? Hugely. <laughs> uh, over the years, we've seen a lot of experience that was built up in the 40 years I've, I've been in the oil and gas business has been lost as people retire or people have just decided they've had enough with the oil and gas downturns or whatever and I, I do know that uh, there is a 
a genuine lack of experience within the industry at present. I mentioned Andy Hill from BP earlier, and I remember Andy Hill uh, making a presentation 20 years ago now, probably, about the, um, the demographic gap which existed within BP uh, for geoscientists. Um, the, all the geoscientists were a very, very similar age and were due to retire in about 10, 20 years' time. Um, uh, we all were up in arms about it. Everybody wanted to do something about it. Nothing was done about it. And uh, whilst I think there has been a slight upturn in the number of people coming into the industry the last five, 10 years or so, uh, the, the big fear is if oil and gas and offshore wind are busy together, mm -hmm. And they are busy together in the next five to ten years, and we just won't have the numbers of people, and we won't have the experience to be able to cope with it. Okay. Well, that answers the question. It's a roundabout way of mm. chatting about things, but it's it's obviously not good that there are there, there are fewer geoscientists undertaking geoscience courses. Okay, Alex, did you want to add any more you, you yourself onto that? No, uh, thanks, Rick. That's absolutely fine. Um, Although I suppose <clears throat> there's a perception as well, um, going back uh, um, uh, maybe a, a, a stage before that, which is of course the perception of geology, uh, offshore oil and gas has been fairly dirty um, and, and people being reluctant to, to follow a career in, in something that's very uh, cyclic as well in terms of ups and downs that we all, we all hear about. So I suppose it's really, uh, educating and informing the, the next generation to ensure that they understand that there is a career, an exciting career in, in marine geoscience. In a clean business. Yeah. Yeah, you're not, you're not wrong about that at all, Alex. Uh, yeah, there's certainly a perception out there that, uh, yeah, that it is a, a sort of a dull, dreary, <laughs> dirty. <laughs> um, so, so most of the people I know have actually worked in the industry have actually really enjoyed it. But, um, uh, it's not everyone's cup of tea going offshore. Uh, it is a, a very alien environment for a lot of people. Um, I, I know uh, I was speaking to some Navy recruiters recently who said uh, one of the biggest barriers they had to recruiting new men and women to go to sea was um, their inability to be able to stay in touch with their friends and families on Facebook and social media. Oh. And uh, it, it's, it's turning out to be a significant problem, because particularly for submariners <laughs> they, you know, who can't, can't communicate at all. And they said it, it, was, it was actually quite, quite, quite an issue now. Um, we've got a question from uh, Neil Wakefield. Uh, he says, uh, Mick, we've seen recent developments in reprocessing exploration data for site survey. Developments in broadband deghosting and technologies such as SWIM and FWI a vastly improved near surface resolution, despite the problems a deep seismic vessel will have in offering integrated geophysical surveys. Do you see value in this approach over a dedicated site survey approach? Um, yeah, there's, there's obviously something to be gained from it. And it's not, um, you say recent developments, I can remember when I actually really did geophysics, which is a long time ago now. <laughs> um, we were actually doing that then. Uh, obviously, uh, the processing um, techniques have really have really improved. One of the problems you have with any exploration seismic program is the way that the data is acquired in the first place and the offsets that you're using, etc. Um, and that you know that is just a physical thing. Uh, whether or not the recent techniques, I haven't seen them. You know, you're from, you're far more qualified to talk about this than I am. Whether or not we've been able to somehow actually overcome the fact that. Uh, the offset on an exploration site request is obviously a lot, lot longer because your um, your zone of interest is a lot, lot deeper. Whether or not we've been able to overcome that in processing, I don't know. Perhaps that's just something you can answer. But certainly, it's not new to have done this. And in fact, uh, uh, when I was working as a project manager some 20 odd years ago, we were utilizing exploration site data um, to look at the shallow geology, uh, but, uh, but not to. Um, not 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 as a substitute for um, a specially planned and managed uh, site survey. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, Neil, did you want to add anything there? Uh, <clears throat> thanks, Mick. So so yeah, I suppose um, swim technology is using multiples to fill in the near offsets effectively. So you are 
you're shortening your offsets that you get um, there. And FWI being a, a velocity technique, um, which gives you much higher resolution in the in the near surface. So they they sort of sort of um, you know fill in that near surface. I suppose uh, I suppose for for uh, I've seen a couple of papers recently about using these techniques to completely replace uh, site survey in terms of the geophysics uh, required, but you know resolution problems and and um, and the like. Just I suppose we're just not going to get there with those plus the time taken to process it and you know site survey very fast turnarounds uh, generally um, and the cost as well of course um, like very expensive techniques yeah um, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I think you're you're much more up to date on these things than I am actually so I, I appreciate the input there but um, yeah, you know, we've looked we've looked at replacing the site survey many, many times in all sorts of different forms, as I mentioned with QA and uh, um, uh, the use of 3D exploration seismic 3D reprocessing of exploration seismic data. Uh, yeah, we've looked at this many, many times and uh, I don't think there's any substitute for uh, um, a specifically and well planned uh, site investigation. Great. OK, well, I think that's that's it for any questions that have come in on the on the chat group. Uh, if anyone's got any final questions, now's your now's your chance to ask them. Otherwise, we'll uh, we'll wrap this one up. Did I, did I see a response from Anna? I saw something pop up on yes, my screen. Yeah, yeah and, and, and Anna's reason. basically said, thank, "Thank you, Mick. Agree with you." Oh, <laughs> <laughs> excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you, Anna. <laughs> yes, that's, that's what that one is. Anna, did you want to add anything there? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> no, no, she's she's not going to unmute. I'll leave her. I'll leave her in peace. Great. Okay. Well, thanks everybody for taking part today. Um, keep this slot free for two weeks' time. We'll have another speaker up for the um, uh, the one o'clock slot on the Monday. And if anyone uh, wants to volunteer to give any talks or presentations or do anything for the podcast. And um, uh, finally, a quick plug, we're coming up to the end of June, which is the end of the membership year for SUT. Uh, you'll all be receiving your, uh, your, 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 your letters uh, politely asking you to renew your membership for another, another 12 months you know, in, in, in coming weeks. And I do uh, earnestly hope that as many of you as possible uh, and your friends will be able to renew for the 2020-21 yeah so uh any final words from you mick and we'll 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 call it a day just to say thank you to everybody who's taking the time to spend an hour listening to um an old fella talk about the old days <laughs> <laughs> that's great thanks very much mick and thank you very much to everybody that joined thank you bye for now bye then <laughs> bye all <laughs>